Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Just give a little bit, a couple of minutes for everybody to join. Shall we? All right, let's do it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Fatal Contraction, Healthcare Adjust to the Shrinking LTC Sector. My name is Emily Trask, and I'll be your moderator. I am pleased to introduce today's speaker, Irving Stackpole. Irving is the president of Stackpole and Associates, Inc., a strategy marketing and research firm founded in 1991. He's been working in the long-term care sector for 35 years. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, via email to all participants after the webinar for further review and sharing. We would love to hear from you during today's presentation and we'll be answering questions at the end of the session. If you have a question, please feel free to send it through the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of your player. And if your question is, uh, if if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will be sure to follow up afterward. Uh, this program has been approved for one continu continuing education credit through NAB NCERS. So without any further ado, I will pass it over to Irving. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And uh, it's a delight to be with you today. Thank you all for joining in. And uh, it's always amazing to me how many people from how many different places sign into these and we're looking forward to continuing the dialogue 
there's some new folks in the audience as well as folks who have been to uh, prior presentations that I've given. And uh, Emily and I were commenting earlier, in addition to scrambling to fix my microphone because the microphone didn't work, we were commenting how the appetite for information over webinars has changed over the course of the pandemic. And of course, now we have live programs that are actually in, in conferences. We've had a very busy fall season with conferences all over, all over uh, many different places. So today, what I hope to cover, and I hope to be able to see my screen, is um, is to cover the what I'm calling the fatal contraction. This is contractions of both supply and demand in the long-term care sectors in both the United States and in uh, the UK and in other uh, EU locations as, as well. But those are the two I'm going to focus on in this presentation. Th it is a crisis and I'll focus uh, in on what we can do now uh, in order to understand what we can do, we need to deconstruct the problem a little bit and look specifically at systems, at leadership, at change and how the sector has been somewhat change resistant. And I'm going to focus, I hope, on some very practical steps. And, and if I can get the cursor to work in the correct direction, here are these practical steps. These are the strategic options for surviving in a declining or stagnant marketplace. And uh, when you receive this uh, presentation or access it on our website, there's a slide at the end that has the citations, the references, which you can see. The first principle in a declining or stagnant market is to defend, protect, and fortify whatever market share you do have. Expensive competition for new market share is unwise, and it's necessary to manage to loyalty. And there's a very specific meaning around that where you want to keep your customers close to you. And that doesn't mean necessarily not making mistakes or having perfectly happy customers but it does mean being transparent and recovering from service errors very effectively. The second principle is to increase productivity and efficiency. Obviously in a declining or stagnant market, uh, it's not the time to add resources, it's the time to improve efficiency. It's also necessary to innovate. Well, how do you innovate? in a declining or stagnant market. I'll talk a bit about that and then differentiate yourself from the competition, which is critical, especially in the direct to consumer market segments of the long-term care sector. So I'm going to cover demand, supply and economics. So the demand side of the equation will include the age, disability qualified populations, that are consuming long-term care services. These segments, so these segments to these markets are important and it's important to understand that there are people in the audience calling, for example, from who are here today from the hospital side. There are people from uh, skilled nursing. There are people from home health care, uh, CCRCs or life care communities. Uh, assisted living, et cetera. I'm going to try to address each of each segment of that demand. Then we're going to look at supply and the principal cr principal ingredient of supply in long-term care is people. And there's a real problem there. As many of you know, many of you have vacant positions uh, and that's creating real fatal contractions. We're going to talk about the built infrastructure, or in the case of home care, for example, the systems. And then we'll talk about the economics and the real challenge in long term care. Uh, one of the real challenges is long term care is the intermediation of the economics in our market. I'll talk a bit more about what I mean. With regards to demand, 
here is the fundamental issue around demand in long-term care. The size of the age qualified markets has been decreasing. It's been decreasing since 2012, as this slide depicts. As you can see here, this is a slide showing the live births in the United States. And this goes from 1910 all the way up to 2010. But the focus here is from 1925 to about, well, today to 19, um, about 1935. This dip, as you can see, this decline in live births is at the heart of declines in demand for age qualified services. So the, the age qualified markets for long-term care, and that's the bulk of the demand is produced by aged individuals, it's been declining. Now, the demand, the demographics, demographics, as I like to say, are like gravity. It's hard to escape unless you're Jeff Bezos and you can, or Elon Musk, and you take, take a rocket to the, to the um, perimeter of, of, uh, of the, of the um, atmosphere. But the size of the age qualified markets has been decreasing severely since 2012. And that's exactly when all the construction in uh, purpose-built housing began to occur. And along the same time, a growth in the proliferation of home care agencies. The demand in, the, the demographic demand is going to hit its lowest point somewhere between today, 2022, and 2025. And as I say here, most seniors housing construction occurred after 2012. So what does that mean? That means we have been experiencing uh, more supply chasing smaller demand. More supply chasing smaller demand, which produces heavily competitive uh, dynamics under the best of situations. Um, and that's what we've been experiencing, hyper-competitive marketplace areas, more supply chasing, chasing dwindling demand. Now, the good news is, if for those of you who are at the early stages of your career trajectories, the good news is that from about 2027, 2020, 2030, we're going to see a real increase in demand. The live births rate began to significantly increase, and we will see that when we reach 2034, 2035, the aged cohort, the people who represent our market, it's going to be as big as it was in 2012. And then it grows dramatically. So the good news is those of you who are at the early stages of your career trajectories, you're going to enjoy a real surge in demand from demographics. Now, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, Mr. Smarty Pants. We just leased up a brand new uh, purpose-built community. What does that say about your theory? And then some others are going to say, our home care agency is as busy as it's ever been. And still others is go are going to say, yeah, but my nursing home, my skilled nursing center is fully occupied. Well, some of the first issue has to do with penetration. The proportion of the age qualified market that accept your solution varies marketplace to marketplace. And it changes. Witness the pandemic. The pandemic reduced the percentage of people who were willing to consider relocating to purpose-built age-targeted housing. Now, as, we, as we'll see from some other data, that's changed, that's moderated in particular for assisted living, but for skilled nursing, it's still a deep problem. Others are going to say, well, what about our home care agency? It's busy. This is an example of sector shifting demand. Demand shifts from purpose-built housing or skilled nursing centers to home care. And there's been a huge shift in that regard 
even though, as we'll see from some data, that shift has not been, shall we say, successful. And then it's location, location, location. If your nursing center is enjoying high degrees of utilization, occupancy, high degrees, very positive rates of quality mix, it's probably because where it is and the nature of the strategic relationships that your center has with the um, higher end, the high acuity providers in that marketplace area. So we've seen these patterns uh, from 1995. Um, my colleagues and I have been lecturing about the shift in demand, the decrease in demand since then. And you'll see here from this chart that from uh, 2000, from about 2010 to 2020, there was a full percentage point drop in the demand, in the utilization occupancy of skilled nursing. And you say one percentage, that's, that's not much. It is, and that's the average, and it is affected more importantly in some places than in others. These impacts are not felt evenly across the board. There are some that are going to be hurt more deeply and occupancy and utilization declines more deeply. And this was the trend before COVID hit. Another giveaway, another solid indicator in the markets for long-term care that demand has been declining is the declining number of SNF beds, the declining number of nursing center beds. This is data that uh, I extracted with a colleague, John Sheridan, as recently as August 2022. And you can see the straight line decline in the number of nursing center beds in the United States. And unfortunately, most of this has been in rural marketplace areas, but the trend is absolutely clear. And this year already, the decline has been even more significant than in previous years. We are going to see continued closures, and, and these rates of closures, by the way, are in spite of stimulus money that have buoyed uh, many nursing centers during the worst months of the pandemic. So we're going to see even more closures. So what do we do? We're going to talk about that. So this is indeed the fatal contraction for the nursing centers and in context for the entire healthcare systems in local marketplace areas, because hospitals rely on nursing centers, families rely on nursing centers, as do other providers like doctors. So here's the age-related housing and skilled nursing demand and what happened with skilled nursing centers. As we can see here, majority IL, majority of independent living communities, according to the NIC data, which is uh, uh, some of the best information we have, even though it's limited, we can see that the majority independent living was least impacted. However, majority assisted living and majority nursing centers were deeply impacted by the decline in demand as related to the uh, pandemic. In the home care market, we can see here that the rates of utilization of home care have basically been flat and are projected to stay flat. That means that even though individuals who want to consume, who want to engage in home care, they will be inclined to require, request, inquire, um, be referred to, they won't be able to secure services, the demand supply relationship will remain basically flat. So there's a qualitative feature to demand, um, and that means that long-term care isn't very attractive, especially nursing centers. The question is, who wants to live in a nursing home? Uh, not very many people. Retirement remains in our culture. Re retirement remains a, a dirty word. Uh, buyers, consumers of uh, purpose-built seniors housing do not discriminate well between and among the different classes of housing and care. Uh, in the business, we talk about these different classes easily and switch between and among them in our conversations. 
but the public does not discriminate very effectively between and among these classes of care. Um, it's, uh, it's getting a little better now that the pandemic has, has created a, a lot of media attention on congregate uh, living. Uh, people are doing a better job, but still there's not a very uh, good understanding in the public. Home is where people want to stay, and I'm going to be talking quite a bit about the demand in home care. Uh, home is where the bedpan is. Can we really support people in their homes? Uh, we're going to see over the course of the next eight to 10 years, an explosion of the number of elderly individuals living alone at home. So that growth in that market segment, that home alone and old segment is actually um, an opportunity. It's a sociological nightmare. We're going to read more and more about loneliness as the new epidemic. It's a new public health crisis, uh, but it's also for us, it should be a, an opportunity and a feature in the markets that we need to accommodate. And here you can see data from uh, the, uh, I think this is from the Kaiser family. No, this is from the Joint Center for Housing Studies at Harvard. You can see the rapid growth, the incredible increase in the number of aged individuals living home alone. Now, it's not so much a concern at 70 to 74. It's even less of a concern at 75 to 79. But at 80 and older, it becomes a significant concern as we know that the utilization of services and medical and healthcare crises begins to grow rapidly among individuals who survive into their 80s. So I want to wrap up the demand side by reminding you all about the demographic facts that underline what we've experienced so far. Separate from the pandemic, the pandemic made this all worse. It exacerbated the situation. It's not the cause of the situation by any stretch. It's just exacerbating. We're at or near the nadir of the demand dip, and the demand will increase starting roughly in 2027, 2028, and certainly by 2034, it will be in full flight. It will be, the demand will be increasing significantly. So I expect and hope that you'll have lots of questions about this. I, there's always questions about this when I present this information. So let's talk about supply. So we've got the demand side of the market equation. Let's talk about the supply side. Supply side is accommodated by three factors. The first is people. People still provide the care. There's the built environment that includes nursing centers, assisted living. Uh, I'm sure you can understand what I mean by built environment. And then there are systems. There are systems that support the care. There are systems that get in the way of caring. There are systems that are positively dangerous. And there are systems that are needed, systems that uh, private providers, technology providers in particular, should be working hard on. Some are and some aren't. Um, I, but I'll have that conversation when we get to there. So here's who provides the care in long-term care. Before the pandemic, this was some of the best data from the Kaiser Family Foundation about people. People in purely econometric terms, people are the means of production for long-term care. <clears throat> and there had been, before the pandemic, about four and a half million direct care, long-term care workers in the United States. And you can see here how these folks break out, how these break down. The proportions in the UK are roughly the same. There's a little more emphasis on home health and social care than there is in the United States. And here are the segments to that supply and breaking down into women, uh, wages, ages, and um, 
ethnicity, color. So there's about, there were about four and a half million. Now, um, one of the things that we have to address and can't ignore is the value of the unpaid care labor economy. It's significant. Uh, it was recently projected, I don't know how valid these numbers are, but it was recently projected that 50% of adults are involved in the care of an aged individual. Think about that. 50% of the population in the United States is involved in the care of an elderly individual, one way or another, directly or indirectly. And that's not a stretch. And we will certainly hit that number and more as we migrate into the later uh, years in this decade and into the 2030s. Who supplies these care? this care? Who works for free? Well, they're elderly. And you can see that as the caring population ages, the more time they spend caring for another elderly person. And in a sense, this makes sense, doesn't it? That as we age, we hope that there are other individuals of our same cohort who are interested in helping and supporting us. <clears throat> from, an, from the economy's point of view, this is also constructive and positive because indeed, once uh, we're out of the workforce and we're no longer contributing, for example, through social security and other forms of taxation, this is where uh, that labor is less impactful on the overall GDP. So this is not an entirely bad situation, although it does not augur well for the future when we hit that steep incline curve. So here's some difficult and unpleasant truth, truths about the professionals who are paid to care for our elderly and disabled uh, individuals. First is that they are um, being churned by the long-term care system. Median annual turnover for registered nurses was very high for licensed practical nurses was extremely high. And for nursing assistants, it's crazy. It just doesn't make any sense. I've spoken about this a lot. The research is clear as to what needs to be done in order to correct this situation. But the segment, the sector is not responding quickly enough in order to plug the holes in this very leaky bucket. This is a fatal contraction of our own making. This is what happened as a result of the pandemic. The payrolls in residential care centers in the United States plummeted. And it doesn't appear as though it's going to get better anytime really soon. Food services, drinking places were closed. They were shut down. That's why their workforce shrank. Ours we're still open, and yet our workforce shrank, was the second largest loss in workers in the United States. And indeed, recent data from the Kaiser Family Foundation shows that community care centers, nursing care centers lost a lot of staff, whereas outpatient care centers, physician offices, hospitals, and home health agencies they did very well, thank you. They picked up the slack, even though there really isn't enough of anybody. And really what we're doing is we're poaching uh, what is a very scarce resource from each other. We are, um, it's just not a very pleasant situation. <clears throat> this is uh, recent data to show that in the losses of employment, in the categories of uh, congregate care centers, nursing centers do worst, do the worst, and assisted living does the best. So this is a bright spot in assisted living. They've been able to hold on to workforce and recoup some losses in workforce while skilled nursing centers have not. And this is indeed part of the fatal contraction to which I refer. So the 
well, how did we get here? One is systems neglect, and some people have argued, and I don't disagree with them, there really is no long-term care system in the United States. It's ageism. The dominant metaphor about long-term care is extremely negative. Uh, long-term care is a business or an enterprise. Is it, or is it a responsibility of the state, of the of the government? That's an interesting conversation. Could be a nice panel discussion if somebody wants to participate in that kind of discussion with me. That's great. Let me know. Talk with me. Um, the pandemic precipitated things. It's not causal. One of the issues, and this gets into the economics, is, you know, it's the money. So show me the money. The average earnings of nursing and residential care center staff is definitely up since the <clears throat> pandemic. The question is, eight, is that enough? Can we close this gap between what we're paying in nursing centers and all private pay, entry-level private pay? 18%, 18% of nursing assistants live at or below the federal poverty level. That's twice the national average. 9% of the national workforce in the United States lives at or below the federal poverty level. Among our nursing uh, assistants in long-term care, that rate is double. Is that tenable? Is that, you know, can we support that? Spending on health care in the United States, you've all heard this, it's an old saw. The United States spends more than twice as much as the next closest country in health care, and yet we spend less than the OECD average. OECD is a collection of developed economies. We spend less, but we spend 243% the OECD average in health care and 46% the OECD average in long-term care. So it is no mystery as to why this fatal contraction aided and abetted by the pandemic, certainly by why this fatal contraction is really coming home to roost. So what can we do? What are some practical steps to operate in this stagnant, declining market? It requires a new game plan. Now, historically, businesses, our clients in the enterprise level, healthcare environments, uh, technology companies, software companies, they have the usual and typical options available to them. Uh, if their market declines, they can harvest or they can stay. So harvesting usually means that you reduce the costs you make your balance sheet and your income statement look great, so you set yourself up for a sale or an acquisition. Well, that's just not an option for many, many providers in long-term care. So because the barriers to exit in our markets are so high, most of us stay, and we stay until, in many cases, the bitter end, as we've seen story after story about nursing homes and other congregate centers closing. What do we do? First is we conserve our resources and avoid costly battles for market share. And what that means is that the smart providers are choosing strategic partners in their marketplace areas for survival, frankly, this is sort of a last man standing tactic or strategy. Lower costs. That doesn't mean cutting staff. You'd like to cut staff if you had staff, but you don't have staff. You need to seek efficiency. Efficiency is, is doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason and having the right outcome. That's efficiency. True quality improvement is all about efficiency. And that's what's needed in our segments in order to survive 
the next six to 10 years. We need to innovate and differentiate ourselves around those innovations. That means new programs with new labels, new with new partners and new solutions to people's everyday problems. What we, one of the things that we know, for example, is that we know that pharmacological compliance adherence is an enormous problem. Um, many, many uh, there are re there's research to suggest that over half of the um, age qualified admissions to hospitals, in, in other words, people who are old who wind up in the hospital, <clears throat> more than half of them are somehow related directly or indirectly to pharmacy, polypharmacy, not taking the right drugs, not taking them in the right time, not taking them in the proper sequence, etc. If we could address pharma pharmacological adherence, if we could address physical uh, barrier limitations, uh, I know that there are people in, in, in uh, low income, moderate income neighborhoods who are still living in fourth, fifth floor walk up flats with uh, stairs that haven't been repaired or haven't been tended to. These challenges can and need to get addressed creatively between and among the providers within a marketplace in a way that cuts through the traditional boundaries around service, uh, service centers, around service lines. So what it also means, what these practical steps include, since we have to stay in the market, it means low cost or no cost marketing. And that means looking at your digital assets and migrating towards a digital presence, not necessarily for the truly aged consumers in your marketplace area, because very often they don't uh, access TikTok, but for the advisors, for the adult children, and for the uh, other healthcare providers that are in your marketplace area who are in a position to influence referrals to your services and your service lines. It also means holding on to the customers that you have. That's only done through customer service excellence. And you say, well, how am I going to generate customer service excellence if I don't have the staff to generate customer service excellence? My observation is that you do have the staff that can indeed recover effectively when service errors occur. But they're not going to do that if they're disinclined, if they're operating in a command and control culture where more is expected of them and the leadership isn't present to encourage, nurture, and inculcate a sense of citizenship in the undertaking of long-term care. So customer service excellence is indeed possible. I have seen it and it can succeed in these environments. The other issue is error recovery. When there's an error, recovery, effective recovery is essential. And that's the, the behavioral science around service error recovery is extremely well known. And many of you would recognize good service error recovery, and many of you would recognize bad service error recovery. Bad service error recovery is sweeping it under the rug. If someone, uh, if, if, a, if an appointment isn't made with a home care agency, or if the bed sore isn't treated in a skilled nursing center, uh, it's not to sweep those things under the rug, it's to address them address them constructively and directly. That's good service error recovery. Unfortunately, because of this, these contractions in both supply and demand, over the next several years, we're going to have to engage in strategies and tactics that really zero in on the last one standing. In other words, we want to make our organization be one of the survivors on the other end of the current 
dip in demand and get to the other side. <clears throat> and in order to do that, we need to defend, protect, and fortify the share that we have, the market share that we have, and manage to loyalty, which as I was saying just a moment ago, is all about uh, having or experiencing or managing service errors and recovering effectively. Second, we need to increase productivity, and that means increasing efficiency. Doesn't mean you cut any more meat. It means you look at what needs to be done, collaborate with your team to find more effective and efficient ways to accomplish that. We need to find ways to innovate, and I would suggest the boldest and shrewdest way to do this is to identify partners in your marketplace area with whom you can collaborate, choose those partners, and create innovative programs that differentiate your service line, your brand, your uh, network from others in the marketplace area. One of the issues that we haven't yet addressed has to do with intermediation. I mentioned it at the very beginning of the program. Uh, there is a stunning growth, a very rap rapid growth in what's referred to as Medicare Advantage plans. These are Part C Medicare plans that are basically private insurance being repackaged and sold to elderly individuals. The fastest growing population uh, covered by uh, Medicare Advantage plans, Medicare Part C plans, are the low income uh, and elderly, in part because these plans have begun to offer services that these populations find very attractive. These plans are basically private plans, and this intermediation in our marketplace area means that we really have a new uh, customer. We, the Medicare Part C plans in our marketplace area are our new customers. We need to understand who they are. We need to understand what their um, business agendas are. And we need to, if we can, accommodate them in the most constructive way possible. Many of you from assisted living and from life care communities on this call probably already understand that a growing proportion of the individuals in your residences are covered by these plans. How to work collaboratively with them will be an important strategic and tactical business agenda item over the next several years. And finally, this differentiation doesn't need to be uh, extraordinarily complex. Uh, I have a citation in the in the um, in the list of the of the uh, references to uh, a famous book on this subject that's very digestible. How to differentiate virtually anything. Uh, Seth Godin's book Purple Cow. So I commend that to you. These are yet a few of the things that we can and must do in order to be among those who see the other side of this dip in demand. And with that, I will say thank you all for your, pres for your presence. Your participation is uh, yet to be seen. Let's see how many questions we have. And uh, thank you all very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Irving. Uh, we do have a few questions um, that have come Great. in and we'd like to invite others as well. Um, so, uh, first, what are, okay, okay, are you, can you read them? I, I, do, I do see a duty here. Um, do you have a quantified projection of how much the demand for long-term care beds will increase over the next few decades? Yeah, I've been playing with this model for some time now, and I do have some models. They're just models because they, hinge on several unknowns. One of them is the success of the Alzheimer's silver bullet. A significant amount of demand in long-term care is produced by uh, dementias, uh, cognitive impairment that's non-dementia, 
and especially Alzheimer's and other uh, related disorders, ARD. So I've been playing with this and looking at what happens if uh, one of these or several of these Alzheimer's silver bullets succeed, uh, what would be the proportion of individuals who'd seek long-term care? So yes, we have, we've done some modeling in this regard and it's very interesting. There's, I see basically three scenarios coming along and I'd be happy to share that uh, offline with anyone that's interested. Um, I see one here. Should I just take them in order, Emily? Sure, I think that works. Okay, so what role are insurance providers, both public and private, playing these trends? Absolutely, yes indeed. They're playing a huge role and the role that really, frankly, frightens me is Medicare Part C. I see a real challenge here. Uh, if those of you who have some familiarity with insurance, you know that insurance runs on medical loss ratios. For an insurance provider, in order to succeed financially, they need to keep their MLRs in a certain range. And that means controlling utilization. That's what insurance does. That's not the agenda for the Medicare program. And it's not the agenda for the Medicaid program, although to some degree it is. But for these Medicare Part C plans, I see a real dance here between the sector and the, and the intermediaries. And that too would make a fascinating discussion if we could get some Medicare Part C folk into a discussion about this, it would make a great panel discussion. But for those of you who are interested in understanding how these hydraulics might play out, I'd be happy to talk with uh, you offline about that as well. And th these are great questions that warrant uh, more detail than the allotted time. Haven't we seen a failure to fund innovation and care delivery aligned with consumer preferences and demands? You betcha. I, let me just give you a perfect example. I'm not a techno guy. I'm not a technically sophisticated guy. But I recognized back in 1993 that the ambient technology, that the surrounding technology in the home was growing very, very quickly, but it wasn't being targeted to the elderly. So in 2013 and 14, I got a patent. You know, Stackpole and Associates got a patent for ambient technology to monitor the movement of individuals within a confined space for the purpose of managing their care. Now, there's not very many patents out there like that. And I'm saying, why? We should have been demanding. We all saw this coming. I'm at the leading edge of the baby boom. And I can tell you that most of us wanna stay home or in home-like environments. And how are we going to do that unless there's effective ambient technology that's passive so I look for a boom in that, and I would call on everybody here who's got any influence to demand, demand from technology providers, more sophisticated technology than is currently available. I, I, I have an old saw that says, the local Kroger's has more sophisticated technology than, than the local nursing homes. And that's absolutely true. Long-term care, is the land that modern innovative technology left behind. And that's that's a not only a gaping business opportunity, but it should be a national embarrassment. <clears throat> okay, I thought we were working under a demographic model that was favorable to our industry. Nope, your presentation is a shocker. Sorry you're shocked. You may be, this may be one of the first ones of mine you've heard. I've been talking about this since 1993. Thank you for a great info. I'd like to share with my seat. Yeah, sure, absolutely, share away. That's, I'm, I'm not here selling anything except these ideas. And of course, if you wanna hire us to do strategic advisory, that's what we do. But the point is, we need to understand what's happening in the marketplace area. Let's see what else is in here. What are there the was, questions? There was Go ahead. One, one question just above that. Uh, about the role of private LTC insurers. Oh, okay. address the so here's, yeah, so here's the question about, uh, I'll read it out loud. What is 
what role is private LTC insurers playing in addressing the fatal contraction? None. None. Do you want me to equivocate that answer or elaborate? None. The penetration of private long-term care insurance in the United States has never exceeded 11%. And it's covering, currently hovering around 10 because the insurers uh, are, are desperately trying to increase their penetration. The private long-term care insurance model is, is kaput in the United States. Their General Electric was, with General Electric, the big company, was almost bankrupted by its very relatively small uh, private long-term care insurance company until they spun it off. They had to spin it off. So they're playing a very, very small role in this now. What's needed, and I talk about this in another program that I've done, several programs that I've done, what's needed is federal long-term care insurance, period, paragraph. Now, those peop some people are going to say, we can't afford that. Nonsense. Japan did it 12 years ago. If Japan did it 12 years ago and their demographics are worse than ours, of course we can do it. There's just not the political will. And we still treat aged individuals, especially those who are infirm or don't look like, we treat them as second class citizens. And until there is a revolution in that, a real change, in that metaphor, the way we culturally think about it, um, it, it nothing that probably isn't, isn't going to happen. And if you want to look at a country that does a really good job with long-term care, look at the Netherlands. They spend a lot, but they get great outcomes, and it's really a positive picture rather than the current picture that we have here, or here and there in the UK and the US. Are there other questions? I Lauren? think that, that's it uh, for today. Okay, uh, I have just 10, I have this, looks like I've been at this now for about 50 minutes. <laughs> if there's somebody that wants to ask, pitch in one more question, I'm happy to try to answer it. Okay, with that, I thank you all for showing up. This has been, it's been fun for me. I hope it's been useful for you. Maybe, maybe a shocker as one of the, one of the commentators said, uh, if you're shocked, I'm, I'm, I've considered my, my, uh, my presentation a success. Uh, be shocked and now get smart, please. Understand what you need to do to survive, what you need to do to serve the bona fide needs of the age, disability, qualified populations in your marketplace area. And if there's some way that Stackpole and Associates or I personally can help, I certainly hope you'll be in touch. So thank you very much. We do have one more question. That oh, just, we got another question. Do you believe that the age, that ageism contributes to the challenges? The word elderly is pejorative. Can we stop using it? Uh, so, so those are two questions in a row, and I'll take them in the order presented. Yes, and I don't know how. Uh, the term for the categorical term for an individual who's old or older in the United States and in the UK, they are not good terms. And there's been hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably in aggregate, aggregate millions of dollars done, research done as to how to change that. And there's really apparently no good alternative. My personal opinion is that we have to wait for, I call myself a geezer. I'm at the leading edge of the baby boom. I think we have to wait for the geezers to give themselves a label and then appropriate that label. But yes, ageism is an enormously um, critical factor in this whole issue. You saw, you know, one of the, one of the famous, one of the smartest guys I know says if you want to understand an organization or a country's strategy, follow the money. Just follow them, see what they spend their money on. And you see that in 
the United States, we spend 246% of the OECD average in hospitals and doctor care. Who consumes that? And we spend 50%, 46% of the OECD average in long-term care. That should say everything that you need to know about ageism in, in the United States. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We hope you found it informative. And if you could please take a moment and tell us how we did, you will be sent to a screen with a brief survey which will help us to improve our presentations. Um, and also we will be sending out the, the uh, video and PowerPoint for your consumption. And thank you again, and we hope to see you at a future program.